Today we're kicking off a new teaching series. And the teaching series is titled, Live Missionally. Live Missionally. There's a call for the church. There's a call for you and I that are in Christ Jesus to live on mission. There is a purpose for your life, a greater purpose for your life. And so the call is for us to live missionally as the church. Matthew chapter 10, I want to invite you to open up your copy of God's word and turn to Matthew chapter 10. If you need a copy, printed copy of God's word, we have some in the next step area. Love for you to take one and uh, read it, own it, uh, bring it back and dig into God's word. <clears throat> the title or the main idea today is simply shake it off and stay faithful. Shake it off and stay faithful. Jesus has already heard, it's already been read. He gathers the disciples together and he instructs them. And there's going to come a point that they're going to face rejection. They're going to face persecution. And I don't know what point you find yourself today, but perhaps you have been discouraged, and so you're not living on mission. You've been discouraged, uh, and so you're not living missionally. And today would be the day, it would be a reminder and encouragement to you today that we are called to live missionally, we as the church. And so if we're going to do that, what we're going to see, we need to shake it off and, and stay faithful. Stay faithful to Jesus and his mission, summoning Verse 1, chapter 10 of Matthew, summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and heal every sickness, disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. We see the, the names recorded, those that Jesus gathered, those that Jesus called. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Pause here. I, I read it once again because I, I want us to understand this list before us. Those who Jesus called to go out to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven has come near. The main feature of this list is diversity. It's diversity. Jesus chose his disciples from, uh, from various backgrounds and life experiences. If you recall in chapter 4, Jesus calls two sets of brothers, these fishermen, to come and to fish for, for men rather than uh, fish. Uh, and then we have just learned that he called Matthew, as was mentioned, the tax collector. I mean, two completely different scopes, two completely different walks of life here. Tax collectors were known as the scum of the earth at this time. Why? Because uh, they were in charge of taxes. And I don't need to say any more uh, for you to, you know, allow it to just run wild inside of your mind. But uh, the scum of the earth. And so here, here's a man of, of reputation. Here, here's, here's men that, that would feed villages, feed towns as they, as they fished. And here's uh, a man who would absolutely rip people off and not think twice about it. And so what a list before us. Various backgrounds, life experiences. And about all that this list had in common was that none of them were pri privileged or came from a high status. And, and as we read this list, as we scroll through this, wrist, this list, we should be encouraged. We should be encouraged that these are ordinary men that Jesus calls. These are ordinary men that Jesus instructs. Instantly we would think, but, but it's Jesus, right? He should go for, for those of, uh, of noble heritage. But no, he just goes for, for those that smell like fish, you know? haven't taken a shower and who knows how long and you know that all kinds of things off the side of the boat and it's just crazy you know and 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 that's who Jesus calls we should find great encouragement in this list before us that's just ordinary people like you and I that Jesus has called on his mission it's his gospel it's his kingdom and that's the list that we find before 
us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, would you write that reference down? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 says, Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing. Do you see this? What is viewed as as nothing to bring to nothing, what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. Oh, what a text. What an encouragement that this is God's sovereign plan. I don't know the last time you just paused and said, thank you, God, for calling me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you that there's a purpose in this life. But you and I need to be reminded there is a greater purpose. We live for the glory of God. That's why we exist. It's for his glory. It's that we might point people to to him and him alone because there is no other way into salvation but through Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is the way, the truth. In a life, no one comes to the Father except through Him. What a calling that you and I have been called. We look at this list and we think, what great men of God. And they didn't start off that way. <laughs> they, they all sacrificed their lives for the gospel of Jesus. We, we, we see that through church history. But they didn't start out that way. And so when we take time to consider our lives, we can thank Him. That he would call you and I to this great mission. Uh, Verse 1, summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and, and sickness. Jesus did not only call the 12, but he gave them power to do what he had called them to do. The same principle holds true Today, whom God calls, God equips. If he's called you, he's equipped you. If he's called you, he's empowered you. At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit of God takes over, lives inside of you. That's why I often say, if there's been no change, I would seriously consider, have I been saved? How can the Holy Spirit of God come and dwell and transform me from the inside out, but there? It's no change. It's, it's just impossible. We're called that, that this body be the living temple. Why? Where the Holy Spirit of God resides within us. And so whatever he has called you to, church, listen clearly, closely today. He is empowering you and equipping you to fulfill his calling on your life. It's not your calling It's his calling. It's not your kingdom. It's it's his kingdom. It's not your glory. It's his glory. That's why we exist. And this is what we have been called into. Praise be to God. These 12, except uh, Judas. Acts chapter 1, we find that Judas is replaced with Matthias. And so these 12 have an important role in the founding of the church. These these 12, this list before us, the apostles, have an important role in the founding of the church. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. What is being built? It's the church. We, we, We exist today, the church, over 2,000 years later. Founded on these apostles, this group of 12 that Jesus summoned that day. And also founded on the prophets that came before these apostles. The prophets of old, they were men of God that we read through the Old Testament and we see these were men of God called to be messengers of God to the people of God. And the church was founded, the church was founded. Only apostles and prophets 
And so these 12 have an important role in the founding of the church. They also have an important role in the future judgment. The future judgment. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on how many thrones? Twelve thrones. Judging the 12 tribes of, of Israel. So the 12 that Jesus summoned that day have an important role in the founding of the church. They have an important role in the future judgment. The Bible promises that their position and work will also be remembered throughout eternity. Revelation chapter 21 verse 14. Would you write that reference down? The city wall had how many foundations? 12 foundations. And how many names? Uh, how many apostles of the lamb were on the foundations? This is the, the first and only time in Matthew. The first and only time in Matthew that the 12 are called apostles. The word apostle literally means one who is sent out. One who is sent out. The original apostles, they were eyewitnesses. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The original apostles. And today, we're living in times today where, where we're clinging and desiring these different titles. Striving to be famous. And the call for the church has never been to be famous, but to be faithful. And so you and I should simply strive to hold the title disciple, follower of Jesus, the way. Now Paul used the term in a more narrow sense. Referring to the 12 and himself by a special, what we would call dispensation or a special selection. And we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Verse 2. If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you. Because you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Notice in verse 1, they're called disciples. And then in verse 2, they're called apostles. Those who were Christ's apostles were first his disciples. Adam Clark says, men must be taught of God before they are sent out of God. They must be taught of God before they're sent out of God. Look to verse Five, Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them instructions. Don't take the road that leads to the Gentiles and don't enter uh, any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go to the lost sheep of the house, the house of Israel. And this is the pattern of the gospel. What's the pattern of the gospel? You say it, it's the Jew first and also the Greek. The Jew first and also the Greek. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and also to the Greek. First to the Jew and also to the Greek. God's intention was to reach the whole world. His intention was to reach the whole world, but beginning with Israel, beginning with Israel. Jesus uh, still called the Jewish people the house of, of Israel, even though they had lost their Jewish state some years before this time. How did they lose the state? The Romans ruled the world at this time. And so they had lost their, 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 their status, if you will, as a Jewish state because Rome ruled the world. But God still saw them as Israel. Even when there was a, not a political entity known as, as Israel. We look all the way back to Genesis to understand. Genesis, it's chapter uh, 12. When God calls Abram, who he will change his name to Abraham. 
He says in verse 2, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Verse 7 of chapter 12 of Genesis says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. To your offspring, I will give this, this land. So God's intention was to reach the whole world, but starting with, beginning with, with Israel. We see Jesus says, instead, verse 6, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 50, verse 6 says, my people were lost sheep. Their shepherds led them astray. Jesus references the, the prophet Jeremiah as he instructs the disciples to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Later, the gospel would go to both the Samaritans and the Gentiles, but it had to begin with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And some, some of y'all might be thinking, well, what, what does all this really mean? And, and who's a sheep and who's, uh, you know, Gentile and who's these others? And anyone non, not born of Jewish descent, uh, you are considered a Gentile. And so that's in the s- simplest way of understanding. Uh, and so that would most likely be the majority of us, uh, the majority of us uh, in here. Jesus instructs the disciples to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, before he ascends into heaven, what does he tell the disciples? He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in, where? Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Before he ascends into heaven, he encourages the disciples he says, hey, you're going to receive the supernatural power. You're going to be my, my witness or a martyr, one willing to lay down his life for the sake of the gospel. And it's going to start right here in Jerusalem. And it's going to spread out. You look to Acts chapter 8. Stephen has just been stoned at the close of chapter 7. The first martyr for the, for the gospel. And, and a great wave of persecution has, has broken out over the early church. And the church scatters. But the 12 remain for the time being in Jerusalem. Look to verse 7. Jesus instructs the disciples, as you go, proclaim the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Go proclaim it. Verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast Uh, Cleanse those with leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Freely you received, freely give. We read this text and we find what they're to do. They are to preach. They are to go preach that the kingdom of heaven has come near. They're to preach. They're to, to heal. The apostles both had a message to preach. And they had a power to display they were to preach and they were to display the power of God everywhere they went through every town to display the power of God look to verse 9 don't acquire gold silver or copper for your money belt so they weren't to go and uh, to get rich (laughs) that wasn't the point of going the point of going was to proclaim And so uh, Jesus, again, is instructing the disciples on this day, this very moment, to live missionally, to go and proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is near. And as they they go, there would be a power displayed within them. But it it wasn't to get rich. Verse 10, don't. Take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals or a staff for for the worker is worthy of his his food. Now, when I lead trips, typically the two questions I can guarantee are going to be asked, 
how much money do I bring, and how much do I pack? You know, when, when, when you consider your, your next trip, you're thinking, all right, what's the budget? Uh, or maybe not. Uh, you, they probably, be, probably should. Uh, how much money, and, and what, what, what do I need? How many days, right? I mean, because no, no, nobody, nobody's wearing like that, you know, dirty underwear twice. You know what I'm saying? So we, we need to be prepared, people. But this is what Jesus says. He says, hey, don't worry about the money. Uh, don't try to get rich. Don't try to fill up your money belt. And, uh, and, and then Jesus says, uh, you know, don't take any other clothes. <laughs> Just go with what you're, what you're wearing. The worker is worthy of his food. When you enter any town or village, verse 11, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Greet a household when you enter it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is unworthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone does not welcome you or listen to your words, notice the next, shake the dust off your feet. When you leave that house or town, truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Shake the dust. If people aren't going to listen, shake the dust. If I had to guess, and I don't like to guess, but if I had to guess as to why some are not living on mission for Jesus, you're not living missionally, it's because uh, the moment you made the decision to do so, you faced some kind of rejection. And so you're, you're, you're scared to death that you're going to hit it again. And uh, can I tell you, you're going to hit it again, but don't be scared to death. <laughs> and so the, the rejection is real. Uh, there, 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 there's hurt that you're holding on to. And Jesus tells the disciples, instructs the disciples to shake it off and to stay faithful. Hey, there's going to be people that, that aren't in, that aren't in. They're rejecting. They are making the decision to reject Jesus. And that's not on you. The call in your life and my life is to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. It's up to each individual to receive it, to accept it, or reject it. And for those who have rejected, shake the dust and keep on moving. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord to create opportunities to move within that person. And in his timing, that that one might surrender over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Shake the dust off your feet and move on. We see in this section an insight as to the instruction to go that God will provide. The disciples had to live by faith. And the same is true for you and I today. That this is a faith journey. And as they go to different places. And hearts are receptive. God uses people in different towns to meet every need. And will you trust that the same God? is still at work today using people as blessings to further his gospel. Look to verse 16. Look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of them. Because they will hand you over to local courts and flog you in their synagogues. You will even be brought before governors and kings because of me to bear witness to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, don't worry about how or what you are to speak. For you will be given what to say at that hour because it isn't you speaking, but the spirit of your father is speaking through you. Now, Jesus gathers the disciples and he instructs them. He instructs them. He instructs them by, don't, don't, don't worry about filling up your money belt. He instructs them by, by don't take uh, extra clothes. He instructs them to uh, look for the homes of peace that will welcome you in. It's all about God providing 
It's all about God providing his provision. And then we look to verse 16, and it's like, whoa. All right. I mean, I'm good. God, I can trust you. But uh, I'm the sheep, and you're sending me out among wolves. <laughs> the, the last time, you know, I kind of put all this scene together is uh, the wolves will tear the sheep apart. <laughs> can you imagine being the disciples in this moment? And Jesus tells them, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Be wise, he says, yet harmless. And he says, beware of them. So not only is the possibility be torn apart like a, a wolf, uh, Jesus says, it's possible that you're going to be thrown in jail. <laughs> it's possible that you're going to be flogged in the, in the synagogue. Can, can you imagine a, a, a pillar where your hands would be strapped to that pillar and there would be a, a belt, not like you were when you were whooped as a child, if you, if you were whooped by a belt. Uh, I, I was, and praise God for it. No, not in the moment, of course. And, uh, but that belt, uh, the flogging would, would be filled with bones and, and, and glass and, and, and uh, metal. And the whole purpose was to torture the whole purpose was pain. The whole purpose was those that were watching, those that were watching the public would say, you know what? I don't want to endure that, so I'm out. And, uh, and this is what Jesus is instructing the disciples to get ready. In this final section today, he is predicting persecution. And so how do I prepare for persecution? Uh, two thoughts. First is expect it. That's what Jesus is sharing with the disciples this day. To expect it. It's coming. It's coming. We as the church should expect persecution. Why? Jesus is going to finish here. And he's going to say, hey, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. We should be a people that expect persecution. We need to expect it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Don't be surprised. Verse 13, instead rejoice. <laughs> rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. Verse 14, if you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Do you see that? I'm actually blessed. If somebody's ridiculing me because of Christ, man, I'm blessed. Because the spirit of glory and God of, of God rests on you. We, we best identify with the Savior through our suffering. And some of you might be in the midst of suffering. Some of you might be in the midst of persecution. If not, get ready because it's coming. We need to expect it. But listen, don't be discouraged. Be encouraged that we best identify with our Savior in suffering. Verse 21. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father, his child. Children will rise up against parents and, and have them put to death. It's a glimpse into the morality of the day. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher or a slave above his master. It is enough for a disciple to become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If they called the head of the house, Bezebul, how much more the members of his household. Jesus is referring to himself as the master. Jesus is referring to himself as the teacher. He's referring to the disciples as the disciples, as those who are being taught. And, and, and he makes the statement, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. How do I prepare for persecution? Second is endure it. 
The first is expect it. Second, endure it. Do you see that in verse 22? But the one who endures, the one who endures to the end will be, be saved. There's, maybe there's some here today that you're, you're on the brink of quitting. Man, you, you want it to end. Can I encourage you to keep on fighting? Stay faithful. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Shake the dust off your feet. The rejection is going to keep coming. The ridicule is going to keep coming. But there's blessings in it. There's blessings in it. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, thank God. They may call us what they like, but they cannot make us evil. God was slandered in paradise and Christ on Calvary. How can we hope to escape? This, this text closes, at least for today's portion, the rather interesting mention of Bezebul. Well, who is Bezebul? It's, you go back, it's known as the Lord of Flies. It's called Satan. I believe Jesus is referring to the close of chapter 9 where he drives out the demon mute man and the Pharisees said he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. They called the head of the house Bezebul. How much more the members of his household. You and I, we, uh, we're under submission to King Jesus. He's the head of this church. I pray he's the head of your life. And if they hated him, you better believe they're going to hate you. Shake it off and stay faithful. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? Those online, would you do the same just for a moment? I wonder if there's one here today. I wonder if there's one here today that maybe you're tired. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you've been walking around with, with, with this rejection. Perhaps you're questioning life significance, the value. Can I just encourage you in this time that God doesn't make any junk <laughs> and he wastes nothing. He wastes nothing. So would you get along with him just for a moment? And wherever you find yourself today, would you, would you just ask him, Lord, what is my response from all of this? What is my response from all of this? Are you ready for the persecution? Are you ready to endure it by the grace of God and with his strength? As people are praying across this place, maybe there's one here, one online that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus. And today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day that you confess Jesus as Lord. Today would be the day that you, you realize you're a sinner and, and, and you, would, you would say, God, forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. And I turn to you. I receive the gift of salvation through the finished work of the cross. I believe Jesus, you walked this earth. You died on a cross. You were placed in a grave and you rose victorious for me. Today I receive you, surrender over to you, and I'll follow you all the days of my life. If that's your prayer, would you thank him right where you're at? In a moment, we're going to sing a, 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 a final song, and as we sing this song, if, if there's one here today, 
find yourself discouraged or you find yourself alone or you find yourself weary, there's gonna be men and women in the different corners of this room and if you're online, there's a host online. And we'd love to pray with you. Men with men, women with women. We'd love to pray with you. We want you to know that you're not alone. Maybe there's a decision. Maybe you made a decision to follow Jesus. We want to we pray for you and celebrate that decision. And I want to encourage you when we sing this song to step out of your seat and move as the Spirit of God leads you to move. Maybe it's that revival. You need that personal revival. And you want to come forward and say, Lord, here's my life. Revive me. Here's my life. Use me for your glory.